want to thank you all for being here as we meet to consider the reauthorization and reform of the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act. I think it is fitting that we look at this act today, given that today is Earth Day. Over the past 50 years, it has played a key role in creating our nation's world-class state and federal outdoor recreation system. I fully support reauthorizing this act this year in a way that reflects the changing needs and evolving viewpoints about conservation in the 21st century. We've got a lot to cover today, so let's begin first with land acquisition. In its first 50 years, this act was largely focused on building a recreation system, and to do that, Congress agreed that it was necessary to acquire lands at both the federal and the state levels. Back then, LWCF land acquisition was largely expected to occur in the eastern states. Even 50 years ago, there was a strong recognition that we should focus on areas with lack of public lands and therefore fewer opportunities to recreate. The Senate and House Committee reports made that point, and the Act itself includes an express spending limitation for the Forest Service. The legacy cannot spend, or the, excuse me, the agency cannot spend more than 15 percent of its LWCF funds to acquire lands west of the 100th meridian. But over the years, we've seen both congressional intent and limitations ignored. The Forest Service, for example, has spent almost 37 percent of its LWCF funds on land acquisition in the West. Now, I'm not opposed to reasonable and justified acquisitions, but coming from a state like Alaska, where close to 63 percent of our lands are already held by the federal government, I do approach the need for additional federal purchases with some skepticism, particularly when we're dealing with tough budgetary times. It seems counterintuitive, particularly in western states with high percentages of public lands, to add more to what we already have and already struggle to properly care for, except perhaps when there is a case to be made that the acquisition would reduce long-term administrative costs. I think we recognize that that makes sense. As we meet today, the federal land management agencies face a growing maintenance backlog, about $22 billion in total. More than $11 billion of that is at the National Park Service. As we look to reauthorize LWCF, I believe that it makes sense to shift the federal focus away from land acquisition, particularly in western states, toward maintaining and enhancing the accessibility and quality of the resources that we have. This is the best way to put our nation's recreation system on the path of long-term viability. Now, some have said that using LWCF dollars for maintenance is inappropriate, but I would just direct you back to the Act itself. The Act states that it is not just about the quantity of recreation resources. It is also about the quality of those resources. Using LWCF monies for maintenance activities is not new. From FY 98 through FY uh, 2001, LWCF was used to, to address the maintenance backlog at all four land management agencies. I do believe, I strongly believe that conservation in the 21st century must include taking care of what we already have, what we choose to conserve first, instead of simply pretending that more is always better. We always talk a lot about access to our public lands, and we've been looking at different ways to use LWCF funds to increase it. And this is another area that is of, of particular interest to me. Many of Alaska's really prime uh, recreation resources are accessible only by plane or by boat. So access is not just about land acquisition. It's also about development of recreation facilities like boat launches, trails, roads. These are the kinds of facilities that are a critical link between users and otherwise inaccessible lands. We also need to recognize that bringing land into federal ownership does not always equate with making it accessible to the public. You've heard me talk here in this committee about the situation with a, uh, a daycare provider uh, with, with little charges, uh, four and five and six year olds, who went out uh, on a picnic in the Tongass and the daycare provider was fined for not having a permit to utilize the picnic table. Uh, she was fined by the Forest Service. A federal lands access provision is also one of the primary and most popular provisions in the Bipartisan Sportsman's Act that I've been working on with Senator Heinrich. 
There are many access-related issues that we can focus on this year. I have, um, again, brought up before the committee my efforts to prevent small-scale filming uh, on, on public lands, uh, making sure that they have access to, to, to filming um, rather than be denied access. And for LWCF, I'd like to see greater emphasis on conservation easements rather than fee acquisitions so that we can continue to acquire lands as working lands and ensure public access. When we talk about the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act these days, it's almost exclusively discussion about federal land acquisition. And, and that's a little disappointing to me. I, I'm honest with you here. Many seem to have forgotten the pivotal role that states have in conservation and outdoor recreation under the Act. From the start, the Act recognized that states were the linchpin and provided federal funding for state grants for recreation planning, land acquisition, and development. The state grant programs require a 50-50 match. In some cases, the states exceed this requirement so that every federal dollar is highly leveraged. On the state side, these dollars go to outdoor recreation facilities near where people actually live, from local city playgrounds, baseball fields, to local fishing holes, and state parks that, that clearly rival some of our national parks. From the start, LWCF monies were to be allocated each year so that federal agencies would receive no less than 40 percent, and the states the remainder. But once again, with over 85 percent of LWCF funds going to federal land acquisition, it's clear to me that we're not meeting that congressional intent. And this has happened even though states have been strong, strong public advocates of, of public access and have worked with our sportsmen and sportswomen to provide hunting and fishing and recreational shooting opportunities on our federal and state lands. The current approach also ignores an area where states can and are doing a good job. Alaska State Parks is the largest state park system in the country. It's, it's our state's largest provider of recreation facilities, such as public campgrounds, and it boosts twice the visitation of Alaska's national parks. So instead of leaving them on the sidelines, I believe that states need to be given the opportunity to lead here. States are in the best position to understand and accommodate the needs of our citizens, and not every state has access to federal recreation resources. Now, there are some who attempt to minimize the roles of the states in land management, and, and, and the, there's, a, there's an attempt to drive a wedge between those who work and recreate on public lands. In fact, some have tried to politicize an amendment that I offered on the budget several weeks back that would provide a budget reserve fund for federal land transfers and exchanges with the states. Now, those who are not from the West may not realize it, but this committee effectively serves as a real estate exchange for the West. Buying and selling land often takes, literally, an act of Congress. These types of transfers and exchanges, both with the states and private parties, are the means of maximizing the value of public lands for hunting and recreation, while allowing Western communities continued access to those lands best suited for multiple use. But ironically, these same entities that have criticized the budget amendment have praised the public lands package that I negotiated and fought to include on the NDAA bill last year. That package struck a balance. It designated new parks and conservation units and transferred and exchanged land for development. It designated new wilderness as well as releasing wilderness study areas. Advocates of conservation and development both recognized that this type of balance was necessary to move significant legislation. And that package almost fell apart over budget issues. And facilitating that type of a package was exactly, exactly what I had in mind with the budget amendment. So I do look forward to the discussion about uh, how we deal with Land and Water Conservation Fund and its reauthorization. But I think that they're clearly and fairly are, are good issues to be discussing here. And as we begin those conversations, I, I do hope that they will, will be productive and, uh, and constructive as we work to, to address areas of, of significant interest and concern. 
I've taken longer in my opening statement than I usually do, but I felt it was important to lay out some of the, the history of this very, very significant act, its purposes, its design, and where, in my view, we have failed um, in adhering to some of the contours of that. And with that, I turn to my ranking member for her comments.